A very good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tuti Gadodia, and uh, I'm an associate in the Frankfurt office of Freshfields Brookhouse Deringer. I'm also a newly appointed steering committee member of Young MCIA. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second panel on day one of the India ADR week. This session is hosted by FDI Consulting, and the topic is a road less traveled on damages assessment. During the session, uh, panelists will discuss various aspects relating to the calculation of damages, in particular, the date of assessment, tax and interest considerations, and the all pervasive issue that is the impact of COVID-19 on damages assessment. So um, to discuss these topics with us, FDI has put together a fantastic panel consisting of arbitration experts, as well as damages experts, from India and all over the world. I will go ahead and introduce our panelists now. In the interest of time, I have been asked to keep the introductions brief, and I will try my best to do so. But these short introductions, of course, do not do justice to our speakers' various accomplishments. So uh, first up, we have Ashish Pan, a partner at Trilegal in New Delhi. Ashish represents clients in commercial disputes before state courts as well as in arbitration proceedings. Next, we have Kunal Vajani. He's the head of chambers at Black Robe Chambers in New Delhi and has several years of experience in both commercial litigation and arbitration. Uh, bringing in the very valuable client and in-house counsel perspective to this discussion, Titi uh, Gandhi, a senior general manager and the head of litigation at Mahindra and Mahindra. And next we have Scott Basil, a partner in the Bahrain office of Three Crowns LLP. Uh, Scott has worked in international arbitration for several years and he has represented clients in both investor state and commercial arbitration proceedings. I'm very happy to introduce my colleague from Paris, Basuda Sinha. Uh, Basuda is a senior associate in the Paris office of Freshfields Brookhouse Deringer, and she has several years of experience in both commercial and investor state arbitration. Uh, joining us from New York, where it is probably still very early in the morning, we have Sharmishta Chakrabarti. She's an associate at Skadden, where her practice, practice focuses on international arbitration. And last, but certainly not the least, I would like to introduce our hosts from FDI Consulting, Mark Besant and Montek Mayal. Uh, Mark is a senior managing director in the London office of FDI, and he heads the EMEA and Asia Pacific Economic and Financial Consulting Division. Montek is a senior managing director and a member of the economic consulting practice based in New Delhi. Both Mark and Montek regularly serve as expert witnesses in international arbitration proceedings. So a big thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. And now I will hand over to the speakers to kick off the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tuti. Um, before, I, thank you for the introductions as well. Uh, before we kick off, Mark, do you want to say a few words on, on, our, on our discussion today before I then bring in our experts to talk about the various topics? Thank you, Montague. Yes, certainly. So, so I think there's three things that we wanted to focus on today. Um, two, in a sense, are a little bit of scene setting before we get uh, to the real topic. Um, the first one is a little bit about the role of experts, the use of experts in, in, in disputes in arbitration. Um, there's perspectives, obviously, from practitioners, from experts, and, and from in-house as to um, the best time and the best way to use experts. That's the opening part. Uh, a little bit of a, a primer or a reminder on, on some damages questions and some damages considerations that Montec uh, will lead. Um, and I think the really interesting topic, in a sense, we get to the best bit last. Um, the, uh, the nature of this or the title of this uh, presentation is The Road Less Traveled. Um, people tend not to focus on things that are fundamental to some damages questions until there's some way into it in our experience, which is why we wanted to in a sense, make that the subject of this topic. And obviously, the date of assessment of losses uh, is a very, um, is a very you know, kind of pertinent legal and factual question that drives a lot of the expert questions that come from that. Um, 
the it's often overlooked that damages assessments are not complete until you've thought about interest awards and until you've thought about the possibility and implications of taxation. Uh, and again, you can find um, that those considerations are overlooked. I have a case in the UK where the views on interest and the views on tax quadruple the basic damages claim, depending upon which route you go. So these questions can be overlooked, but, but fundamental. Um, and the thing that, in a sense, has brought all of it uh, back into the spotlight is COVID, because the implications of the last year uh, for um, the data which you assess a breach, um, the considerations as to whether there has been damage or a breach, your expectations as to what would have happened, um, all of which have changed radically and continue to change as the pandemic um, rolls on uh, across the world and in different different ways. So, so these these in a sense these questions have become emphasised by uh, by the pandemic uh, more so, and, and as we go forward um, and economies work out how to recover through changing taxation uh, and as interest rates move up and down again as an economic consequence of the pandemic, some of these issues will become even more sensitized. So it's um, it's timely that we can uh, try and wrap it all up here in this one panel. Uh, back to you, Montek. Thank you, Mark. And we'll do our best given, given <laughs> it's definitely not a conversation which is limited to one hour, but getting straight into perhaps the first set of questions, uh, which is on the role of experts and, and how they're used often in, in arbitration and disputes. So the, the dictionary defines an expert as a person who is very knowledgeable about or skillful in a particular area. And in the context of disputes, we see experts come in various shapes and sizes. So you might get industry or subject matter experts like an expert in telecoms or in gas or technology, or you get skill specialists like valuation experts, accountants, engineers. Such experts can offer um, evidence or analysis that might be relevant in the context of establishing and assessing damages. Some of the questions that are often put to experts include valuation of businesses and shares, loss of profit calculations, analyzing costs incurred in business activities, or the effect of disruptions and delays on such costs, value of patents and IP rights, another theme which is often explored in, in disputes. At, at least in the context of international arbitration, we are, we are witnessing an increase in use of such experts. But let's learn from our panel today on their experiences of using experts in their matters. So Scott, first up straight to you, and perhaps the, the real question is, as counsel, can you do without experts? Do you see benefits of using experts on, on the matters you are involved in? Thank you, Montek. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you um, on, on this panel today. And I think it's useful to sort of take a step back and think, well, why would you need an expert? And I think it's useful to to remember that the only reason you need an expert is if they are going to help the tribunal to decide the issues before them. And so often at the start of a case, you will look and see, okay, what are the, what are the drivers of the outcome in this case? Which of those can I show with documents, which are legal questions that I can plead, which are factual questions that may require an explanation from somebody who was involved, and then which are issues of judgment that are going to be outside the tribunal's area of expertise where they would benefit from having an engineer, an accountant, an economist um, to help them understand the debate in front of them and navigate their way through it. And you know, I think um, if you think about quantum experts in particular, when you have complicated disputes, the valuation issues tend to be very complicated. And what the experts can really help is to identify the methodologies. Well, how do we, what are the available methodologies? What are the pros and cons of them? And then within those methodologies, what are the parameters that the tribunal will need to decide to um, to re arrive at a number, and then what are the considerations, what is the data that allows it to do that? And that then gives the tribunal a roadmap for their decision, which they wouldn't have without the experts. And um, 
And so to me, that's, that's really the value of the quantum experts is to help the tribunal navigate their decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And Ashish, um, coming to you, uh, what's been your experience of using experts on India-rated matters? You do international arbitration work and you also do domestic arbitration work. What is, what's been your experience of using experts? <clears throat> Thanks, Monte. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to be amongst all of you today. But just, just, just on this issue, I think India has it's, it's grown into the culture of having experts in, in arbitrations. Having said that, I think we are still a little far from how it is in international commercial arbitrations in, in some ad hoc domestic arbitrations. Ex, at least the quantum experts are still sort of finding their way into the system. But you know, just taking a point, what was saying, I think uh, what is what has been for me the 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 most significant change in the last five years is that the Indian clients have started to believe that the role of an expert is equally important as the role of the counsel in the arbitration. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things, the trends that I've seen is that the clients now have started to engage with the experts prior to even making that claim because uh, we've been advising on that aspect that you know, if you do it post facto, once the claim is already in, then you're trying to justify the, the, the damage that the quantum that you've specified. So it becomes a little difficult to work backwards as opposed to having the expert on board before you make the formal claim in the tribunal so that the, the expert can give you a reasonable assessment of how good or bad the claim looks like. So We've seen that trend from a quantum expert perspective change a little bit in, in the Indian context, but I, I would personally like it to be uh, even more frequent. Uh, we're all working towards it. Clients are also becoming, uh, uh, they're rather understanding the, the, the relevance of an expert. And I think uh, one of the key reasons has been that once claims have been rejected, you know, they come back, the clients come back to us and say, and ask us, what was the reason? And, and, and our plain response is that you just couldn't justify the claim. I mean, you could have letters, you could make a claim, but it's, 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 it doesn't have any value unless somebody who is an expert in the field can, can really <clears throat> uh, provide a detailed report and analysis of why that claim was made in the first place. So, that's the change that I'm seeing. Uh, having said that, other than the quantum experts, I think from, uh, from, from generally the technical experts, we've seen a growing trend. And I can tell you that I haven't done an arbitration in the last five years where we don't have a technical expert either in the real estate side or in the engineering side. So you always do have uh, a lot of these experts deposing on uh, technicalities and, and more so in infrastructure arbitrations, they are they're a lot of it hinges on them. So, you know, the, the role of the expert, uh, we tend to sort of look at the role of the expert from a limited prism of just the quantum expert. But I think, you know, as we grow, uh, we need to understand that an expert will have to be a combination of a quantum expert and a technical expert if the arbitration so desires or if the claim so desires. So I think it's a grow, it's a, it's a changing trend, Montek. And I think we've, 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 we've done... I wouldn't say extremely well uh, in that sense from, from an Indian, Indian arbitration perspective, but it's a change that I see uh, will keep growing and it'll, be, it'll happen for the better in the coming future. Thanks, thanks, Ashi. And I think I completely echo your views in terms of the change that has been brought in in the last, especially five or six years, I believe, um, in the increasing use of experts. Um, Sharmista, going coming to you, Scott mentioned, you know, obviously one of the benefits or one of the roles actually is to provide or offer evidence that allows the tribunals to make hopefully better decisions, more informed decisions on, on quantum issues. But as, as counsel, what kind of qualities do you look for when you are out looking for experts? Thanks, Montek. That's a great question. And I think a great way to start the discussion about experts because the very first thing that we as the council team will do when we're looking at experts is to interview a panel of them and see who is best suited for the case. And something that Ashish mentioned a minute ago also resonates with this point. Very often you'll want one person who is able to not only opine on the damages, 
but also speak to certain technical aspects. So very often, I mean, I know FDI has people like that. Um, all of the big shops that do damages valuations will have people who provide a combination of both technical expertise as well as damages expertise. So that's one thing to identify at the very start is like, what is the kind of person you're looking for and who will be able to speak to your case? Um, a couple of other points which might be interesting just to throw out there for the panel to think about is when you're appointing and you're a law firm appointing an expert, there's very often the tendency to go back and reappoint the same people because you've come very comfortable appointing the same person ag again and again. And that's a point that we as counsel now are very conscious not to do because it raises another whole host of issues relating to challenges of experts. For example, I was um, in one case where Professor Vicuna was, uh, the late Professor Vicuna was nominated um, as, um, um, apologies, he was nominated as, as the chair and you had arbitrator challenges, but you similarly also have expert challenges where experts are appointed by the same firm constantly and then they get challenged. Um, so it's, it's interesting also to look into the relationships the expert has with issues and what positions they've taken in the past, because very often during cross-examinations, what perhaps you and Mark may have faced in the past is you will be asked about your prior reports. So it's a very detailed um, exercise, and it's a lot of research that goes into appointing the expert. So, so yes, there's a lot, lot of things that goes into even that decision about who you're going to pick when you're starting off um, with the expert appointment process in an arbitration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think yeah, that like you mentioned increasingly as counsel and law firm partners sitting as arbitrators, again, the relationship between the next person and the counsel and the, therefore the arbitrators also is quite important to bear in mind. Um, I think uh, Scott, I'm going to come back to you and flip the question a little bit. Um, Shemista was kind enough to answer and tell us the qualities she looks for. What are the qualities you should be avoiding in choosing your experts? Uh, thanks, Montek. Well, I think the one quality that I try to avoid is an expert who sees themselves uh, as an advocate. And um, that, you know, it's, it really is important to distinguish the role of the independent expert who's there to assist the tribunal from counsel who are there as advocates for the party. And you know, in my experience, there are, um, there are experts who um, there's, there's a risk that they, present or appear as overly partisan as advocates, and then they immediately lose their credibility. And, and that also relates to how you work with them. You know, I want an expert who will push back on pressure from the client, say, to come up with a bigger or smaller number and will say, you know, I, I can't stand behind this. It needs to be robust because when you get to a hearing, there will be cross-examination, there will be tough questions from the tribunal, and what you want is to know that what you're presenting will be robust against that kind of challenge and not just telling the client what they want to hear. Thank you, Scott, thank you. Um, before I move on to Deepthi, uh, Shamisha, just one, one quick question. Um, obviously, I think these points are quite relevant, especially for party-appointed experts. Uh, what's your view of tribunal appointed ones? That's a great question, Montek. And again, another um, area which is quite often written about these days. On the one hand, you know, you have an expert presented typically by the claimants, another expert presented by the respondents, and they very often have completely opposing views. And if you're the tribunal and you're faced with, let's say, claimants experts saying the claim is valued at a billion, and the respondents experts saying, hang on a second, it's, it's worth nothing. Now, as the tribunal, how facile are you with the DCF model? How facile are you with running the numbers? So I've seen in a couple of my cases, at least recently, that the tribunal itself will suggest to the parties, we would like to appoint an expert to guide the tribunal on certain issues. Now, as counsel, you're then in a very interesting position because on the one hand, you want to appease the tribunal and you'd never want to say no to a tribunal, do not appoint an expert, but it raises a number of questions for counsel because you want the tribunal expert's role to be very well defined, 
So very often what we'll see is that a terms of reference, much as you have the terms of reference for the panel, will be drawn up where it's critical to understand what the role of that expert is going to be. And another thing that you want to be very careful about is that this expert who is assisting the tribunal should not become the so-called like fourth arbitrator who comes in and substitutes his or her judgment for the judgment of the tribunal. But it, it can be, I think, in some cases, very helpful where you have a very complicated damages case and not necessarily a panel who understands the model to help the tribunal appointed expert explain those numbers to the panel. But it's certainly an area which is developing, I'd say. And, um, you know, there's interesting work coming out of that. Thank you. I think the, the point about this, the range of damages that are often put forward by the opposing parties is a, is a very important one. Um, and that's too common in international arbitration. Uh, Deepthi, you've been very kindly been hearing to others talk about use of experts and running your case essentially. Uh, but what has been uh, your experience as, as essentially the end client who is often either bringing a claim or defending one? How important is, in, in your view, is it to support your claims properly today in front of tribunals, whether domestic ones or international ones? Hi, so welcome to all the participants who are hearing all of us. And I thank Montek and Neeti uh, from MCIA uh, for bringing me on board on this panel. Uh, I speak from a perspective of a conglomerate as large as Mahindra and Mahindra. And uh, we have a huge amount of various products that we manufacture and we sell, as well as several services that we provide to our various clients and bases the entire gamut of the services and the products that we sell. I, I you know, handle the litigation in relation to those sectors and businesses of Mahindra. Uh, there are two, three things here, Montek. One of them is a lot of depends, the need for experts depends a lot on the type of matter, the type of a case that that is initiated uh, by or against Mahindra's, and also uh, the forum, uh, and whether the forums are in India, or they are abroad, or they are international arbitrations. So when I talk about a large, when I talk about the volume of our litigation uh, that Mahindra has, it's largely based out of India and it's not, not so much abroad. We do have a few matters abroad, but they are not of such large volumes. So considering the matters that we have here, since we sell a lot of consumer-based products, a large part of our litigation is consumer-based. And the, uh, the quantum of claims are based on the products that we sell. So whether it's a tractor, whether it's a helicopter, whether it's a defense, uh, you know, defense, uh, we have Mahindra Defense, which manufactures arms, et cetera, whether it's an automobile or it's seeds or it's agri products. Essentially, the litigation emanates from consumers who are dissatisfied or it emanates from or against the dealers who sell our products or our service providers. So a plethora of our litigation is based from these various parties end to end. Considering that for consumer related litigation, we do, and, and before, I, before I say this, uh, as a manufacturer, we have a huge R&D uh, uh, specialists of our own in all fields. We also have many technical experts, engineers, et cetera. So whenever there is litigation in the consumer field and they are not of very high stake, we do use technical experts, but they are technical experts giving in-house reports. Only when a judge requests for an unbiased external expert, there will be a rare such situation where a judge says that, do we produce an external expert, but the, but the quantum of the matter or the, the amount is so low 
that to have external experts appointed would only add more value and burden to the client or the end business that we are talking about but if it matters or if we have to prove a point we definitely would employ or deploy a technical expert from outside so having said that my overall experience except in a few large volume cases uh, we do not employ deploy experts um, for the reasons that i mentioned but yes for we have had international either arbitrations or litigation before itc etc where say our patents had to be you know the 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 validity of our patent that we had or the validity of the agreement that we entered into with any other party in relation to the patent that we had or the design needed a technical expert and at, at those times which are a few we did appoint technical experts thank you and i think that makes a lot of sense i mean of course it depends on the nature of the claims you're bringing and if you have access for those kind of issues in house then you're often able to rely on them but i think your experience still mirrors what ashish was also saying with that in terms of generally the use of experts external experts has still been quite a new thing perhaps um in in india um uh, thank you thank you very much i i just wanted to add one more thing which i have missed and that is that uh, that a lot of our uh, contracts with our dealers service providers uh people who supply us goods spare parts etc our contracts are very waterproof and watertight uh, we also have a lot of uh, most of our contracts have arbitrations especially institutional arbitration now as a mode of dispute resolution considering that our contracts are so watertight even when there are claims of damages against us by dealers etc most of them are resolved through the discussion or the evidence based on the contractual clauses and and therefore we really need experts due to that as well so i i just thought i should mention that that's a as ideal because it takes into the next set of questions i want to ask on getting to the how do you think about damages and 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 how do you measure those um but thank you i think that's absolutely very relevant because clearly the contractual terms will have an implication as well on what type of claims you can even make um in 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 a dispute uh now using that as a segue to the next set of questions i want to ask before we move on as mark said to the the main event of today's discussion uh very briefly we want to cover on terms of types of damages or type of claims you see um being made in 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 disputes of course the object of an award a damages award is to adequately compensate the injured party to the extent the money can uh for example lord blackburn uh in livingstone versus uh royards uh coal described damages as a sum of money which will put the party who has been injured or who has suffered in the same position as he would have been in if he had not sustained the wrong for which he is now getting his compensation reparation public international investment law has its own nuances but as a as a tribunal in hojo factory case explained reparation must as far as possible wipe out all the consequence of the illegal act and reestablish a situation which would in all probability have existed if that act had not been committed restitution in kind or if this is not possible payment of a sum cost putting the value which restitution is in kind would bear on this basis in almost all cases damages are assessed by comparing the financial position the injured party is actually in which is often referred to as the actual position with the financial position the injured party would have been in absent the wrongful act complained of which is often referred as the but for the counterfactual position this overarching framework gives rise rise to two common approaches to assessing losses namely expectation loss which is essentially based on the expectations from the affected asset of the contract and reliance loss which is based on investments and costs incurred to develop or build the affected asset or under the contract of course there are other forms for example compensation based on the gains of the defendant or the respondent liquidated damages uh, but that's that's for another day when this background let's explore these issues in some more detail vasudha uh, coming to you first um legally speaking what is the difference between expectation loss and reliance loss and when might one be granted 
in, in, uh, over, the, over, over the other. Thanks very much, Montek, and thanks for the invitation to join you here today. Um, Going back to the two kinds of damages you just mentioned, expectation loss and reliance loss. Expectation loss is um, what you've just described, what we would call the normal rule in the common law or the compensatory principle, which is a sum of damages that would restore the claimant to the position it would have been in had the contract not been breached or had the wrong not been done. Uh, reliance damages contrast with that a little bit. They're the damages that would restore the claimant to the position it would have been in had the contract not been concluded in the first place. Um, and so the reason the expectation damages are referred to as the normal rule is because that's the default rule, at least in, in most common law systems. You know, the idea of a contract being an accepted allocation of risk between the parties um, and damages being the means of restoring the economic balance between the parties that should have been in place um, had the contract been executed. Uh, so that's generally that's the that's the normal rule. That's the that's the uh, that's the measure of damages that parties will generally seek uh, or argue about. Um, the problem that sometimes arises with expectation damages uh, is that it's difficult to quantify, um, <clears throat> particularly when you're looking at long-term contracts or contracts that have a lot of contingencies built into the into them or rely on a number of external factors. And so where it becomes um, not difficult, but impossible or close to impossible to uh, set or to determine uh, what the party, what position the parties would have been in had the contract not been breached. Reliance damages end up being a fallback me mechanism or means for a tribunal or a court to, uh, to compensate the injured party uh, in a manner that uh, gives some certainty uh, to the parties about, about what they're restoring. Um, what what wrong has is being undone by the damages, uh, but without having too much uncertainty or too much contingency being built into the award. Uh, so um, often you'll find tribunals who struggle with damages um, uh, focus on reliance damages as the means of compensating the injured party because of the certainty it provides. Uh, whether it's always the correct means of of compensating that party is is debatable. Um, sometimes it's it's the it's the lazy approach to damages, as some would say, um, and so it really it really depends uh, on a tribunal's uh, numeracy um, and its ability to look into the the nuances of a damages case. Uh, that will often affect whether reliance or expectation damages end up being awarded in international arbitration. Thank you, and and yes, it's. it's Sometimes referred to as a lazy form, but also hotly contested, in which might be the right appropriate. Uh, um, uh, that is certainly the more diplomatic approach. So, of course. Uh, but just, uh, just, for, uh, just to clarify for the audience as well, is the injured party? Uh, it doesn't mean must must it elect one form of damages at the outset? Is it do do parties uh, sort of quantify both and let tribunal choose the right measure? What's what's been your experience on on that? Uh, parties can take different approaches. Uh, generally speaking, I think you'll find a claimant will put forward the case that will uh, most reasonably allow it to achieve the greatest amount of uh, damages awarded. Um, and so in some cases, seeking expectation damages may um, may result in a much, much larger award than reliance damages, but simply be unreasonable based on the facts of the case or, or the applicable law, because the law itself will often determine whether the injured party can seek reliance damages or expectation damages. Um, what, what you'll often see um, is a claimant putting forward that, that highest case, the most beneficial case in its, in its first round of submissions, it will obviously get a lot of pushback from the respondent in, in its responding submission. And so you may see an alternative theory of damages being put forth by the claimant in the second round of submissions. Um, th that's a strategic issue. There's no rule of thumb on that. Uh, and certainly no hard and fast rule either. Um, and sometimes, the claimant will not give up its primary position at all 
uh, during the course of written submissions, but will arrive at the hearing and the tribunal's questions to the claimants, to the parties, and to the damages experts in particular uh, will identify um, a particular leaning of the tribunal one way or the other. Or the tribunal may specifically direct the parties to give damages numbers based on a particular approach to damages that it, seems, it sees to be most adequate. Um, so it really depends on the tribunal and the parties in terms of, of how this plays out in, a, in an international arbitration in practical terms. Thank you. And I think, uh, yes, yeah, Shamisha was also saying in the first round, if the other side comes back with a number zero, you might want to put an alternative, um, uh, which is not zero, perhaps. Um, but Scott, just using that, what's, what's your view on this? And what are the main legal issues that, uh, in your view on how to measure damages for different types of claims? Uh, thanks, Montek. Well, I think the first question you need to ask yourself is, what is the claim? because often the nature of the claim will determine which framework you should be looking at for damages. But I think it's also, you know, since we're talking about commercial and investment arbitration, it's useful to consider how things can look a bit different in a, in a treaty arbitration. And I'll just give an example from, from a, a real case that, that sort of highlights how this can play out. So the, the issue was a mining concession that had been terminated by the state. And so the question is, well, how do you, how do you value that? And the, the usual approach under international law is you look at the fair market value of the asset on the eve of the expropriation. But then the question is, well, how do you value a mining asset? And, you know, and setting aside questions about illegal and legal expropriations and whether a different standard applies, and obviously Montek, you and Mark would be better placed to discuss this th than me, but just in, at a simple level, you have different methodologies that you might apply to a mining concession depending on where it is in its life cycle. So if it's a developed mine producing minerals with good records of cash flows, you have data that allows you to build a DCF and an income-based model. Maybe if it's a bit earlier in its life cycle and these types of interests are traded, you might be able to look at comparable um, mineral assets that are being traded and arrive at a value that way. But if it's earlier in its life cycle, you may, the appropriate approach may be to say, well, how much did it cost to do the exploration work that's been done to get this asset to where it is in its life cycle? It's too speculative to do a discounted cash flow analysis, but you might think, someone buying this asset would be effectively buying the data, buying the work that's been done on it. And so the cost of doing that work may be the right, at least starting point for assessing the value. And then, you know, if that's your framework, well, then it starts to look like a reliance loss claim, but legally it's a very different claim, but in, in practice, you're looking at the same kind of data. So I think it's, you know, it's useful to think about each case on its own terms in terms of what the right approach to damages will be. Thank you. Um, Shamisha, just building on that, of course, there is the point about the relevant uh, commission standard, there's a point about the contract, but often you see tribunals choose one over the other for other reasons as well. And both Vasudha and Scott touched upon it very briefly in their, in their answer. Uh, what's, what's, what's your experience of of this, when do tribunals, when might tribunals choose uh, reliance loss over expectation loss? Absolutely, and um, as you mentioned, Montek, both Scott and Vasila did touch upon this. Um, what I've seen in my experience is tribunals, when they are unable to quantify or project, for example, in a DCF with any certainty what the cash flows are they will then turn to the safer bet, which is to say, okay, so you as an investor, how much of money did you invest in the project? And we'll, we'll give you um, that plus sometimes they'll give like a top up and how they arrive at that top up, you can ask the tribunal that. Um, but you know, there is no uniformity in practice, I would say it depends. It's really a case by case analysis that you have to do. You'll have some uh, tribunals who are very much not inclined to um, 
credit the DC evaluation when, as Scott mentioned, that mine, for example, did not have past cash flows or um, revenues that they could look upon. But then uh, there are other tribunals, which especially more recent ones, which have adopted DCF valuations, um, even when you have so-called startup companies or nascent companies. And uh, there's one case which many people uh, in the audience might be familiar with. It's the 2020 decision of uh, CC Devas against the Republic of India. And um, I'm, I was counsel in that case. And that was a case where just by way of very brief background, um, Antrix, which is the commercial arm of India's space research organization, entered into a contract with a company called Devas. And the merchant investors in Devas sued the Republic of India when India canceled that contract. Now, when we came to the damages phases and the quantum phase of this arbitration, India argued that Devas, the company, was a startup and had no historical cash flows, and the value of the company was nothing, next to zero. We, on the other hand, and this is a great example of how different valuations play out in real life, we value the company at over a billion. And how do you have a workaround in this scenario? The workaround here was we were able to show and persuade the tribunal that one of the investors in Devas, which was a commercial actor acting on an arm's length transaction before the expropriation happened, was able to come in and it valued the company prior to the government's expropriatory acts, generated cash flows, which we then projected forward into the future to arrive at a number. And just to add one more point to this, um, you had mentioned a minute ago about like, do claimants typically advocate for just one valuation methodology or are there multiple? And uh, here, what we did in this particular case, for example, and it's a public case, so you can go and read it, um, we adopted multiple valuation methods and there were similar transactions which happened in India at that time, including the Reliance Geo transaction, which gave us good anchors to anchor our valuation. Um, and then stepping aside from just an example of a case, even if you look at modern, and this is something that Scott mentioned, if you look at BITs and especially the modern iterations of BITs, you will see that in the investment treaties themselves, um, the standards that the treaties will put forward are that they will suggest that you look at fair market value, you also look at comps, you look at tax based values. And so I think there is currently a trend that claimants are expected to put forward more than one valuation to support and anchor their valuations, especially where you have startups. Thank you. Um, I think and for the benefit of the audience as well, I think at least um, in terms of not necessarily um, jurisprudence or, or evidentiary value, but treaty cases at least provide some context to when tribunals have rejected uh, forward-looking measures or as Mr. Yu was saying, discounted cash flow methods on, on valuing assets. And the common thing that comes out is essentially entities or startups, essentially entities which don't have sufficient history of profits or operations, uh, which perhaps give the tribunals uh, which, which perhaps make the tribunal more reluctant to grant large damages uh, for such entities. Mark, we've heard from the legal side uh, on issues which perhaps provide, um, you know, which, which make tribunals reluctant to grant large figures for early stage businesses or, you know, startups essentially. What, what is, what's your experience uh, of, of such assets and what can experts do perhaps uh, to provide more comfort in certain circumstances to use for, uh, to use forward-looking measures to assess value of these early stage companies. So I, I was I was interested in hearing um, people's experiences because what I've probably seen over the years is um, tribunals initially being understandably um, cautious about complicated cash flow models and. Um, long-range plans for businesses or assets at, a, at an early stage of their lives. Um, I think, though, uh, tribunals have become increasingly confident with such models because they've become exposed to experts and exposed to um, exposed to their experiences uh, sitting on panels and acting as counsel. 
um, which has made them more confident uh, using DCF models. I think there's a danger that in that, that they become overconfident in using these models. Uh, and, and so I think what that really means by way of a feedback to, to the experts is helping tribunals rationalize positions. You, you come full circle in a sense from populating complicated models with a whole series of assumptions of which there can be legitimate differences of opinion but you have to rationalize and cross-check the endpoint. Now that's sometimes why people go all the way back to, as was essentially said, some form of disguised reliance measure you put in a hundred, how could it be worth a thousand? Um, but some cases it's a question of rationalizing against, uh, against market, um, market benchmarks, or indeed just the economic circumstances in which it is possible that the loss can have arisen. So I, I increasingly find myself um, explaining and rationalizing, and, and indeed other experts doing the same thing, um, why a model's output makes sense as much as why the model's inputs make sense. Um, and for me, that's, I think, the most kind of important thing. And separately, uh, I think people have begun to develop more sophisticated uh, techniques because you end up with quite binary views. You know, this discounted cash flow uh, is worth a billion when in reality, you may be dealing with a range of possible outcomes that some form of scenario planning will help the tribunal investigate, or you may be dealing with something that's best understood as a loss of a chance, for example. So, so again, the, the extensions that, that one sees are people using, um, using a combination of legal principles and kind of economic principles to get people more comfortable with an answer rather than betting the farm at one end or other of the spectrum. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, and, and like any evaluation method, garbage in and garbage out. So you have to be conscious about what's going into your model before you can conclude on what's coming out. Correct. Uh, Deepthi, just uh, coming to you in terms of more broader experience, and I remember during our conversations, you also practiced as an external counsel before, before this role. Um, what's been your experience of tribunals in India granting large, large claims? Granting like sizable value, valuable claims, especially when they relate to, um, you know, long-term contracts or, or damages based on forward-looking measures or profit-based measures. What's been your experience? Are, are courts, are tribunals granting such figures, or are they still quite conservative? No, I think they are quite conservative, uh, and especially uh, figures or claims of consequential damages, uh, loss of profit. Etc. So even if you can prove it, it's a little hard to establish. Even if you can establish it, I think courts do take a conservative view. There are those few one-off cases, or there are tribunals, especially arbitral, ad hoc arbitrations, where we've had some judges who entertain some part of this. But to the best of my experience, so far as uh, claims that I handle or the disputes that I, I see, whether they are institutional arbitrations, ad hoc arbitrations, or matters across India in court or abroad. I mean, abroad, I, I don't want to speak too much about abroad, but uh, the few that I have done, I haven't seen, or some of them we have settled out of court, but like we haven't had any major disputes where we, you know, managed or even the opposite party. So we have a, have a lot of our claims of our dealers. We have a lot of dealer related claims against m, &M which we defend. And as I said, because our contracts are so watertight, we have managed to win most of them. But having said that, it doesn't stop them from claiming consequential damages, loss of profits, et cetera, et cetera. And just to give one matter, that I recently did during the COVID times, we are in fact going to claim loss of profits, consequential losses, et cetera. But it's still to be tried and tested after we make that claim on how the courts are going to see it. Perfect. Ashish, anything, any, is your experience similar? Uh, I mean, and, and to the extent the courts and tribunals are conservative, is there a reason for that? Is it less sort of comfort with such analysis or is it perhaps the lack of evidence that might be led by one by the injured party on such claims? 
So it's it's actually it starts with what Deepti was start what she talked about was how the contracts are actually drafted and and historically you know the contracts in India would always have a <clears throat> would always have a rider saying that no additional costs they would liquidate damages they would always restrict uh, you know there were restrictive provisions traditionally and I would say that now <clears throat> especially from from modern day contracts those provisions are being highly negotiated because of because of knowing that there could be consequential damages that could be asked for in the later stages. But yes, I do agree with what Deepthi is saying that uh, courts and tribunals in India are a little conservative. Uh, what is funny is that uh, a, a tri uh, an arbitrator who would be sitting in an ad hoc arbitration may not grant that relief. But he, if he's sitting on an international commercial arbitration, which is institutional, he would find it very easy to kind of grant those claims. So it's a, it's a mindset issue. Uh, it's not anything else. But as I said, uh, if we have, uh, you know, more sort of judgments coming in from different high courts, which uphold awards of high value, it obviously uh, gives a, a comfort factor to the tribunal. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, more than the, <clears throat> more than the, you know, sort of experienced uh, arbitrators in today's age, Younger arbitrators are even more proactively granting, you know, claims of of substantial amount. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a changing trend, as I said. Uh, we're just not there, but we are on the path. Um, so if we do uh, indeed have a combination of, you know, a little bit of modernization of these uh, contracts, along with, you know, a little bit of, uh, and and I, and I go back again that you know the role of experts becomes really important here because you know if you have the experts in before a claim is made and it's a robust claim then you know you 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 have to find a way that the tribunal will grant you that damage right uh, the claim for damages if you give them an excuse to not grant you one they'll they'll jump on it so uh, you know the fact is uh, the role of tri the role of parties you know sort of Re revamping their contracts along with the role of experts, uh, you know, in the whole process of conducting arbitrations in India. It's a, it's a mixed sort of approach, which will help us uh, come forward. But yes, as of now, uh, as Deepthi said, uh, we are still on the borderline. Thank you. Um, now, taking that into uh, some of the specific questions which we promised at the beginning we'll answer on some of the nuanced issues that you end up dealing with in, in the assessment of damages. So I'm going to go straight to the first one, which is date of assessment, um, which is quite important. And it's perhaps I'll put it to a speak on why, why it is important. Um, Masuda, what is the relevance of the appropriate date of assessment in a, in a damages claim? And what are the usual choices that you come across on that, on that date? Um, so the date of assessment is, is uh, in obvious terms, the date at which the losses or the damages in a case are calculated. Uh, and I think Mark mentioned this earlier, it's an issue that straddles the line between fact and law because you know you can pick any date um, and assess the, the value of a contract or the value of a business going forward or going backwards, um, depending on what the inputs uh, are. Uh, and so depending on the date that you choose for, for assessing damages, it can significantly um, affect the valuation because, for example, uh, projections of the business going forward will be affected, interest rates, so the appropriate interest rate will be affected, um, the, the cost of capital will be affected. So, you know, the, all, all financial inputs that go into the calculation of damages are dependent on the date at which they're, they're assessed. So that's why the valuation date matters. In terms of what the options are for a valuation date, the, the two obvious uh, choices are the date of breach or um, the date or generally the date of award. Um, and depending on the circumstances of the case, uh, one may be more obvious than the other, but in some cases, both may be options. Uh, and it really depends uh, on the circumstances of the case uh, in terms of which one is, is the more appropriate one. Um, and so, uh, I think Scott alluded to this earlier, but you know, you could if you're in in the circumstance in an international investment treaty case of an expropriation, 
uh, and it's a it was a lawful expropriation. And the only question is, well, what is the uh, appropriate measure uh, of the damages, or what is the appropriate compensation that should have been awarded for the for the expropriation? Uh, then it will be the val the valuation date will be the date immediately before the expropriation was affected. However, when it comes to unlawful expropriation, the valuation date may change. If the value of the business has increased after the expropriation was occur, uh, occurred, um, then some tribunals may be inclined to um, not penalize the investor uh, for, for having lost control of that business after that expropriation. And so it will choose or allow the claimant to put forward and adopt a valuation date after the date of the breach, after the date of the expropriation. Um, when it comes to contract cases, the date of valuation is often determined by the substantive applicable law. And so um, in the common law tradition, the date of breach will be the date of valuation for, for a contract breach. Uh, that's, that's pretty established and, and fairly uncontroversial. So it really depends again, um, as I think we've heard it from all of us across the panel, the facts of a particular case and the facts of the claim will always um, affect uh, what the appropriate data valuation is, um, but certainly what the facts of the world are on particular valuation date will affect the quantum of the claim that is possible. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and of course, as you said, it's important because it, it's the cutoff date for an assessment. So often values and experts will not use any information beyond that date for assessing the value of the claim. But just using that um, to come to my next question to you, Sharmishta. So obviously, there's an option, there's a choice often in certain cases. The law obviously will impact the date, which is relevant. But what's been your experience of, of the appropriate for assessing losses? Is there often a one right date over the other? And, and what are the factors which one might consider in choosing the appropriate date? I think Basada covered it quite well, and um, it's hard to say whether there's one right date. It really depends on the facts of the particular case. But typically what you'll see in the case of a lawful expropriation, it will be the date the expropriation took place. It's in the case of when you have an unlawful expropriation that things get a little bit more interesting. Um, just one uh, case that I'll throw out, out there that I'm sure everybody has talked about and heard of is the UCOS arbitration. And I thought the tribunal's decision there was very interesting because it actually said that UCOS, uh, the investors, as let's use the word victims of an unlawful expropriation, were entitled to choose the date that they wanted, whether it be the date of um, the breach or be the date of the award. Um, so that brings in, I think, like the latest trend is more tribunals are actually going towards, you know, if the claimant, as Vasudha put it, would be in a better position by getting damages at the date of the award, they will be so inclined to do it. There's like a whole trend of cases, ADC versus Hungary and UCOS being like the two ones that come top of mind. Um, the other interesting piece, and I'm not going to go in, into it in any great detail because it'll take forever, is when you have creeping expropriation. So you have a series of tax measures, for example, which result in the loss of an asset. It becomes a very interesting question there is like, what is actually the date of assessment? Is it the date of the first tax measure? Is it the date when the investor loses control over the investment? And so these are, as uh, Mark mentioned, like interesting questions of fact and law, but the two markers are typically like if it's a clear expropriation, the date of the expropriation or the date of the award, those are the choices. Thank you. And I think in terms of even contractual claims when there are continuing breaches, things become quite, quite interesting. Um, so just using that, we can now go to the next topic of interest and often avoided, but can be quite large, uh, especially when the damages occur over a period which is far before the date of the award. Now. It's important, but like I said, often ignored, or at least properly analyzed. So, Sharmisha, coming back to you straight, actually, is what what are the what are the different forms of interest one might claim in in when you're assessing or making a claim in in contract under contractual claims, and yeah, what are the benchmarks do you often see, which are used? Sure, it, it's a great um, 
point because you're right, like when you're writing a memorial, the interest comes at the very end. Um, even though it comes at the very end, the amount of interest might have a very significant bearing on what your client um, is either required to pay out or is going to recover. Um, uh, for example, um, in terms of the forms of interest, uh, you could have typically like pre-award interest, which would be the date from the interest accruing from the date of the breach to the date of the award, which in itself can be significant. And um, one case comes to mind there, um, Teneris versus Venezuela, where I believe the breach happened sometime in 2006, and the award was only rendered probably uh, maybe eight to 10 years later. And so the principal damages awarded there was about like in the range of 80 million, but the pre-award interest was about 85 million. So if you forget the interest component, you, you're losing a very big piece of the pie over there. Um, the second part of interest is the interest that starts accruing from the date of the award to the date the award creditor gets paid. And that interest rate is also quite substantial because, sorry, the interest component can be substantial because if you have an award debtor who is refusing to pay, then that number can also very quickly start adding up. Um, very often you'll see that the post-award interest rate is sometimes higher or given as a co compounded interest because it's meant to be as a deterrent to the award debtor and encouraging the award debtor that you should pay as quickly as you can, otherwise that number is going to keep increasing. And an example that I can give there is, again, in the same Davos um, arbitration I mentioned, the ICC commercial arbitration, uh, the commercial damages that were, or sorry, the principal damages that were awarded was in the range of 560 million. The two date, um, that has not been paid. And so the interest component on that now is runs over 600 million. And so there you go. You have like now over a billion dollar award outstanding just because of the interest rate. Um, in terms of benchmarks, um, we could go on and on about this, but uh, typically what you'll, you'll look for, um, it, it depends again, like who the party is claiming for it. Um, if I'm acting for the borrower, I'm going to look for the highest rate of interest I can find. Uh, what tribunals will look at is they'll try to see that what is your borrowing rate, for example, like how much do you, how much of money would you um, have to, how much of rates would you have to pay in order to borrow the money that is now stuck in this litigation dispute? Um, or they will look often at like alternative investments, like what, how much of money could you have generated if you had put the money that's stuck in this dispute in an alternative um, uh, venture. So there are a couple of choices you can look at. Um, but yes, just to wrap it up and neatly, interest is often overlooked, but it's often a very large piece of the pie. And so it's worth uh, thinking about at the very beginning of the case, not at the end. Thank you. Uh, Ashish, what's in, in India, perhaps the timelines for setting a case can even be longer. So interest is even more important, perhaps in many, in many disputes. But what's, what's your experience with interest-based interest claims or interest claims in your arbitration and what are the rates that you come across often? So uh, I think uh, it's pretty similar to what was being talked about earlier. And I think one of the things that we need to consider in, in, in sort of Indian arbitration context is that, as you say, as you said, you know, it can take years for them to finish uh, and perhaps post the amendment, the situation has become a little better, but uh, you know, the interest component, again, what's missing, and I'll come back to what is the usual rate of interest, but what's missing today is what Shamishta was saying on, on the evaluation of how the interest rate is calculated. I think even the tribunals and even the councils at times just make it as a passing affair that, you know, give us interest at 18%, whereas there's, there's no analysis to why you're asking for 18% or why you're asking for a 15%. And and, I, and I've seen, and, and personally for in some of my cases, I've seen arbitrators, some of the sort of more <clears throat> financially savvy arbitrators have started to understand that, you know, you can't get an 18% interest just for the asking. You need to give a analysis of it because then perhaps delaying from the claimant is better off because they're getting 18%, which they'll never get anywhere else. Uh, so, 
uh, you know, there's there's that analysis that's missing, and 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 courts have started. There there are a couple of uh, judgments of high courts which have started saying that what is the logic of going with these high interest rate percentages, etc. So usually in India they would say two percent above the borrowing rate, the standard borrowing rate of the uh, of the Reserve Bank of India or the State Bank of India, and two percent above that. Uh, or at times if it's an international commercial arbitration, they'll they'll look at the LIBOR rates and all of that. But there are some benchmarks, but I think what's missing uh, really in an interest claim is how do you come to that figure? Whether it's in, in the facts of your case, whether that interest rate is justifiable or it's not justifiable. Are, they, are, are the claimants trying to get unjustly enriched by interest rates, whereas really they are the ones who've, who've delayed the whole process? So it's possible. I think one of the things in Indian court's perspective, a lot of uh, judgments have been passed on this is interest rates can be punitive at times, but the courts don't like to keep the interest rate as punitive. But I do agree with Shamista that, you know, interest rates for me post award should be punitive because uh, frankly, the, 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 the person would keep going on and on with the appeal processes and keep delaying it. So, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no penal, uh, <clears throat> they, he doesn't get penalized or they don't get penalized. So I, I am a strong believer that post-award interest should be at the highest uh, slab of interest rates to, to ensure that people actually pay after getting an adverse award. Yeah, it's to incentivize the payment. Otherwise, in, in some ways, sometimes the respondents, um, the interest they have to pay is lower than what it costs them to borrow money from the market. Yeah. So there's absolutely no incentive to, to make the payment. Uh, thank you. Um, we're moving a bit behind time now, so I'll to wrap it up quite quickly. Uh, we only have a couple of issues left. Uh, Scott, tax is something um, which perhaps we don't need a full discussion for, it'll take a panel by itself, but obviously it's an important consideration and can cause, as Mark also said in the opening remarks, substantial over under compensation if not dealt properly uh, when it comes to uh, assessing your claims or even in, when you're awarding damages. So in your experience or in your view, why does tax matter in assessing damages and what are the key issues that you have come across which one should keep in mind when putting claims forward? Well, thanks, Montek. I think one of the things you need to keep in mind is how damages will be treated in the relevant jurisdictions from a tax perspective. And you know, will they be treated as income? Will withholding tax apply? Will VAT apply? Um, and you need to think that through to make sure that the amount of damages is appropriate so that the claimant is actually put in the position they would have been absent the breach rather than under or overcompensated. And the other thing you need to be careful to do is to make sure that the requests for relief are formulated with sufficient precision that the award you get will be effective. So we had a case, an expropriation case, where the tribunal awarded damages net of all applicable taxes. But then if it's not clear which taxes apply, you just had, uh, and we did have, a post-award fight seeking clarification of the award to actually put a specific number on that so that um, you know, the, the government in question couldn't simply say, oh, this won't be taxed, or we can't know what the tax is until um, you file your tax returns uh, 18 months from now. And at that point, the tribunal is no longer in place to police how the award's been implemented. So, you, you know, you do need to think about these things up front and make sure that your requests will be effective without needing the tribunal to stay there. Thank you. Um, and I think the other issue that becomes, like you were saying, which is quite relevant is sometimes the profits or the, or the, or the profits we're expecting in the contract would have been taxed at a different rate in, the, in your counterfactual versus the rate which now might apply to the award. Um, and again, those differences can be quite substantial as well. Um, so now to the last topic, and unfortunately you can't talk, have a session today I think in any field without talking about COVID. Um, and I think it's it's played its own part in, in, in complicating the perhaps already complicated question of damages in many arbitrations. So Scott, again, coming, coming to you first, why are such extreme external events like COVID relevant in, in, in when you're preparing and assessing, assessing damages? 
Well, thanks, Montek. Um, but tribunals are always reluctant to grant windfalls to, to a party. And so big, um, big economic shocks like this will give, make a tribunal want to be very cautious about how they're going about their valuation. They don't want to disrupt the contractual allocation of risk, for example. And you can see how this would be the case in any valuation using a, a discounted cash flow model where the question will be, did this big shock, and it could be COVID, it could be a financial crisis, currency devaluation, whatever, did it happen before or after the date of valuation? If it's after, well, then the, the normal principle is that it shouldn't be taken into account. If the government, expropriated my theater in London on the 1st of January, 2020, uh, it doesn't matter that COVID meant it couldn't be operated from March any more than if it had burned down in March, that wouldn't be relevant. The question is, what would someone have paid for it in December? But it's very hard to get a tribunal to ignore the, this hindsight bias of something that shouldn't affect their judgment, but, um, they, they consider to be, uh, to be relevant. And, and maybe just an, an anecdote of how um, COVID is playing out in a real case. So we have a, a case now where there's a, a concession agreement, which is for a particular period of time. And the concessionaire paid an upfront consideration to be able to operate the concession for a certain number of years. And now the government who sold them the concession has implemented measures against COVID, which mean during a number of months and now more than a year, it couldn't be operated. So then the question is, well, how do you, how do you value that lost time? How do you, how do you assess um, you know, who should bear that, that loss and, and at what level? So just interesting kinds of issues that are cropping up now. Thank you. Uh, so the, obviously there is, and it interacts nicely with the first question we were discussing on date of assessment, uh, where the strict date might be in principle, like Scott said in December 19 or January 20, yet, yet there's an, an event like COVID uh, a few months down the line. Uh, what's, what's been your experience um, with tribunals? Do they, do they avoid looking at, at, at hindsight in such issues or are they compelled to take into account? And any other considerations or any aspects that you consider important uh, for parties putting their claims forward during a period which can be, I think, at the very least defined as a very volatile period of business activities. Thanks, Montek. You know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I think it is always case specific and tribunal specific. I think there are some tribunals that are very focused on uh, a principled ap approach to damages. And so if they go with a valuation date, that is date of breach, um, they will on principle say, well, we can only project forward as of the date of the breach. So any facts that occurred after the date of the breach that were not foreseeable at the time of the breach, we will simply disregard. I, I think there's a trend away from that or that is starting to occur, that is largely driven um, by tribunals that are concerned with, um, with awarding damages that most accurately reflect what you would refer to as the, as the um, actual situation versus the but-for situation. Uh, and so when they're looking at awarding damages, they're looking to not overcompensate claimants but also not undercompensate claimants, and at the same time, not over or under penalize um, uh, the injuring party or the or the respondent. So it re it really depends. I, you know, one of the interesting facts that we're encountering right now are cases that were argued before COVID, um, uh, and that went to the tribunal for deliberation. Uh, uh, before COVID, but where the award is coming out after COVID. And so particularly where um, damages have not uh, formally been bifurcated as a, sta as a stage of the arbitration, but where the damages assessment may be done in a separate stage, none nevertheless, uh, it will be interesting to see how the how tribunals that we're dealing with right now are, are going to address that situation. It's, it's something um, that is developing and I don't think there's any particular trend or any particular answer on it. I think 
uh, it is very, very tribunal and fact specific. Thank you. I think the other, perhaps, and 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 this is perhaps my last question to the to everyone on the on the panel before we move to our closing remarks. Uh, I appreciate we are now twelve minutes behind time. Um, uh, but just you know, we discussed obviously data of assessment, and I think the other complication which often arises is keeping that aside. Let's assume the data is not a quite issue here, and you have to take into account COVID in your assessment of damages. How, how comfortable are tribunals still granting large figures? Let me put it the other way. You have to dissect or perhaps remove the effect of COVID from the effect of the breach. And obviously that becomes quite complicated when, you know, depending on which business you are in. Um, for example, if you're in an airline business, it wasn't the best year, yet you might have suffered some harm on account of certain breaches. So as a question to, try, to, to all the panelists perhaps is, are there any, do's and don'ts, any considerations to keep in mind when you're trying to present a case for damages and you have to deal with COVID in, in one form or the other. Well, maybe I'll just offer one thought, which is, you know, if you're, suppose you're bringing a claim now and you're trying to do a DCF analysis and the question will be, well, when is COVID going to end and what is the world going to look like afterwards? And, and nobody really knows the answer to those questions. And I think it really highlights the, the general problem you have with these kinds of models where you're making projections about the future. Um, ultimately, however, it, you know, we just do the best we can. And you, you see tribunals, you know, they, they ultimately they have to decide these cases and they have to put a number on it. And so, and we had a tribunal recently make this point, the data they had was not very good. One of the parties had not complied with document disclosure and they said, well, we've just got to do the best we can with what we have. And that, you know, that's all you can do. Yeah, I think what Scott is saying, <clears throat> Monte, is, is it's even relevant from an Indian context that you know, in the last one year, I've seen the tribunals, uh, you know, being a little reluctant in pa in in passing any orders or or or, or granting any damage, uh, where people have taken a bigger defense of COVID as opposed to a breach, because uh, you know there's so much uncertainty around it that no one knows that whether this was the right approach of uh, of 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 claiming amounts or not. I think what I've seen as a trend, and maybe Deepthi can also, <clears throat> you know, give us an indication. But the clients today are looking at more from that perspective to renegotiate the existing contracts on that issue because they're saying it's difficult to to assess the damage today because of COVID because uh, uh, it's so intrinsically linked with the breach uh, and the and the trend that is there that the tribunals are also reluctant in passing any adverse orders the clients are sort of moving towards getting a, a business continuity plan with their con counterparties and seeing what's best for them from a business perspective. Thank you. Um, with, with that, um, thank you, at least my thanks to the panel, uh, but Kunal, could you do the honors of, of, the of the closing remarks and then we can close the session as well. Thanks, Montek. I'm willing to do it, provided you assure me no damages claim from MCIA, Madhukeshwar, and Niti. Uh, we we passed our time at 1 p.m., and uh, I'm sure everyone's hungry, so I, I, I'll stay as brief as I can. Uh, very important situation, uh, road less traveled. I feel I agree with Ashish that it's road now being traveled. Uh, people do see a paradigm shift. The shift is from having a expert being engaged in a timely manner, the expert being brought in to assess damages, to understand damages before the real war is shot out. And I think uh, that's where the key roles like Sharmishta, Vasudha, Spot play in advising uh, general counsel like Pitti to understand that, you know, do you have a robust meat in the matter? Is this worth a journey to travel? So I would I would turn the topic for the day a little bit around to say that the topic would not be that the road is not traveled or less traveled, but the road is traveled in time. 
very interesting point that Sharmishta brought up, and it's it's very very important and something uh, I didn't know uh, was falling part of challenges. I thought we did have a regime around the bias positions of the arbitrators, not bias positions of the experts that you bring in. So Montek, I think that was a key indication. Sharmista is going to break friendship with you soon. Uh, she, she's not going to have you around many times uh, on a lighter note. But Sharmista, I think uh, it is known a fact that uh, great things never came from the comfort zone. So if you want greater, robust reports, they would never come out of the comfort zone. We will have to, you know, answer the question that you raise as to who. And uh, one of the very key important points uh, that was raised by each of you is in this who comes two hats. One is technical, one is quantum. And uh, both becoming very important. How you amalgam them, how you make it more cost effective, whether one team is able to do it or you need two different teams becomes a very important question. Uh, just an observation in terms of the modality of a proceeding, particularly in the range of the infrastructure arbitrations that Ashish was mentioning. If you have a person or an expert wearing two different hats on the technical and the quantum side, it becomes very, very difficult for the tribunals to reconcile the two. So I think the answer to that who, in my experience, would be that you get one qualified uh, assessment quantum analyst who has the experience on the technical world of that nature of dispute as well. That becomes a very, very important because then to bridge as legal counsel, each of you, or for a assessing a general counsel like Dipti would be very, very difficult to even understand as to how they need to amalgam the two versions of the report, one on technical side, one on the quantum side. Uh, very important as um, a question raised by Montek. Uh, in terms of the mindset. Uh, why is the world in India so conservative? And uh, I think uh, a very, very uh, good point raised by Ashish to say that it changes. And that's been the Indian way. We are, when it comes to the international world, we wear a different hat. When, you, when we use the Indian world, we wear a different hat. And that's the, that, that needs a change, I think, with the paradigm shift in the mind that we need a good expert that mindset to accept a robust report, which may probably, as Scott was saying, windfalls won't happen, but windfalls could happen. Consequential damages ought to be seen, could have been a mindset which needs now require changing, which needs more deliberation, which needs more discussion. Uh, in fact, one of the key issues there is the interest rate and the kind of judicial intervention that we have still on the face of it in India, the interest rate will always keep mounting because the court has understood one thing, we won't stay the award, but the proceedings are not accelerated within time. So then the interest rate is obviously doubling up and increasing. So, you know, like the panelists mentioned that there is a clear view that you see that uh, the interest rate is so high that it has reached astronomical versions of changing the entire quantum of the award. So even in that in assessment of the interest rate, it becomes very, very important as to how you place the damage issue with the help of the experts that, you know, the, the entire situation is, is then brought into a situation like Mark said, rationalized. So rationalization, the role of an expert to take the uh, tribunal to the zone of rationalization is now become of key importance. And the last uh, magic word that you used, and we are back in the second wave, at least in the jurisdiction that the PI Ashish on Montek, you are sitting or the MCI team is sitting. Uh, we're in the second wave and uh, we were suffering. So this magic word has, is an unruly horse. Uh, the first principles that we were taught at law school were that status quo is an unruly horse. Today, COVID is an unruly horse. So uh, we don't know where it starts. We don't know where it ends. We don't know its boundaries. We don't know its parameters. So um, it's very, very difficult. But uh, to marry that with your contract, I think it's become very important. It's sad as a legal practitioner, often I am told to use COVID as an excuse 
it pains you that you know covid is used as a real point to renege and then have you know instead of a breach a, another counter claim of damages but that's something which i think what we will have to work over in times to come because it is an unruly horse i don't want to keep the lunch waiting and the next panel delayed and with that i thank each of you for spending a lovely afternoon and i will take this also as an opportunity on behalf of fci to each of you for you know agreeing to sit by and spend this time afternoon discussing a path which is being traveled thank you thank you a quick word of uh, thanks from the mcia as well and especially to fdi montek and mark for putting together this very interesting discussion uh, so thanks everyone and hope to see you soon <laughs>